experimental section on microwave cavities. And the first speaker is uh, Diego Blas. Okay, All right. you, you have uh, 25 minutes for the talk plus uh, five minutes for the question. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Um, and thanks for the invitation. I'm putting together the, this very nice meeting again. Uh, since the last meeting, I was really excited about this topic and looking forward to start putting more effort into it. So yeah, I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, I, I want to say that I am now uh, in Florence, in GGI, and the Edurom fluctuates sometimes. So I hope it works fine. But if uh, not, please, <laughs> I mean, I will maybe try to connect to another network. Okay, so just drop me a line or something. All right, so this is um, supposed to be a session on experimental uh, uh, part of, of this workshop and well I am very far from experiment but uh, on the other hand I think is the, the, the way I have uh, uh, thought about the talk is on putting some more uh, energy or some more emphasis on some details that as a theorist one needs to figure out uh, before even going to sensitivities and stuff right so there are some uh, part of the calculation, which even though they are kind of classical, sometimes are not completely, you know, taken into account in this uh, field. And yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, uh, we can discuss them. Uh, on the other hand, what I'm going to talk about is based on uh, the work which we are about to finish, hopefully, with a bunch of great uh, people. Uh, some of them were interested in this topic because they already had done work on using superconducting radio frequency cavities for actions and some quite uh, amazing new uh, sensitivity possibilities uh, with new ideas. Um, other people, yeah, like me, you, we wanted to, as I said, explore gravity waves. So in the end, I think it has been a great uh, collaboration. And uh, yeah, as I said, hopefully we'll, we'll put out uh, our results soon. The next talk is, by the way, by Rafael Tito Dagnolo, who will show more the, you know, he will get more the dirty details. Uh, for me, as I said, I will be more on the, on the first, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, practical uh, details for the theory part. So, yeah, let me again uh, uh, tell you what these kind of uh, electromagnetic or uh, detectors are looking for. Okay, I'm not only going to discuss electromagnetic the uh, possibilities, also the possibilities of coupling to the wall of the cavity, but for now, let's start with this one. So um, when you have a Lagrangian, well, a, a theory where there is light, um, light fields, and they are put in the framework of general relativity, so uh, very beautiful and elegant Lagrangian, once you start uh, uh, trying to understand how do the fluctuations of these gravitons and photons talk to each other, you realize, uh, as it was realized long ago, that there is a way in which the electromagnetic field, a mu, couples to a current sourced by H, H being the perturbation, the gravitational wave, and another, that's very important, another field of the electromagnetic uh, sector, right? So there is this current, uh, an effective current, Coupling uh, H, right, the, uh, the gravitational wave perturbation to um, to the electromagnetic field in the presence of some other electromagnetic field. So, in in other words, if you if you think about this in terms of a uh, um, vertex of interaction. Okay, there is or, or a Feynman diagram. There is a gravity wave with a certain frequency that's going to be very important which couples to an uh, electromagnetic wave with some frequency and a background. And of course, because of energy conservation and momentum conservation, the frequencies of these three guys should add up, right? So if there is a background which is constant, then this guy will have the frequency of the previous one. And if not, yeah, the thing is uh, you can do some kind of heterodyne searches. So you can look for different frequencies if you are able to play with your background, right? That's the first thing. There was a question about uh, this uh, particular point on cavities, and that drives me to my, my second slide, which is which kind of uh, 
of, of uh, searches one can do with cavities, at least the, 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 the straightforward ones. So the one on the left are the, what I call empty or ADMX-like cavities. So you have a, a, a box, if you want, <laughs> for a theorist, cavities are a box, where uh, in principle, uh, you need to, to, to load, you need to do something with the background field. So because you want to, to remember to, to use this vertex. So you want to study a second, uh, you want um, electromagnetic uh, um, production secondary, you need a, some background field. So you can take the background field as a constant, the magnetic field, for instance. So it's, it's empty, the cavity in the sense that there are no normal modes, just a, a zero mode going through it. And when the gravitational wave comes in, all right, it may, due to this vertex, excite one of the normal modes of the cavity. And if this happens many times, if the Q factor is big enough, then you load, you load this cavity, right? That's the first thing. But you can also start at the frequency of the signal, in this case, is the same as the frequency of the initial wave. And that's very important uh, because, well, you, of course you can play a bit with this, with, with some, you can play some tricks to, to do a, a kind of a small broadband searches, but in principle, uh, you are kind of, um, uh, constrained to, to look for waves on this particular wave uh, uh, range. If you load the cavity, though, if you have a cavity and there is a initial, uh, an initial mode, then uh, you can play, you have more freedom because in this case, the, the frequency of the second wave can be what well, will be the difference on the initial one and the one you've loaded. And in this sense, you can go to much low, I mean, you can, uh, Play with the frequency of this wave and also go to much lower um, frequencies, right? With the same kind of geometry. So there are these, what is called heterodyne searches, okay? Because as, compo as, as opposed to homodyne, where you have one frequency here, you, you can play more with the frequencies. Most of my talk is going to be about the, the first part because the calculations are more a bit easier, but um, uh, what we are doing is in our work is basically both both cases and uh, Tito will will show how this extra possibility of loading the cavity first uh, will I mean brings uh, very exciting possibilities. But that's not all. Well, first, I, well, that I already said that that's not all. The, the cavity itself can act as a resonator. So uh, before I was telling you that uh, I can have this uh, coupling, this uh, graviton to, to photons coupling, but also you, you think about a cavity either empty or loaded, and there is a gravity wave um, going through, then it may also uh, by, make it vibrate, right? A little bit. And in this sense, uh, it's a bit like, well, there are different possibilities. Uh, I, I like to think about this as a kind of Casimir effect, right? Even in vacuum, the fact that you you make this uh, vibrate uh, will load the, the cavity from even from nothing. But if you already have a loaded cavity, either ADMX or uh, this other possibility, the idea is that by, by the by the fact that you are changing the boundary conditions, let's say then uh, your mode, your initial mode, is no longer an eigen mode. So uh, there's going to be a time dependent um, evolution, and you're going to generate or extra 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 modes, right? Uh, so that's what is called the mechanical coupling of the gravitational waves to the walls of the, of the cavity. Again, in our work, we are uh, working in both and we're putting all together and uh, one, some searches are better for some frequencies, other for other frequencies. And as I said, uh, Tito will show our preliminary results putting all together. All right, are there any questions at this moment? I hope it's clear. Can you still hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, sorry. I want to check from time to time because as I said, the, yeah, uh, I, I, do wrong. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so as I can see here, omega is represented by gravitational wave. Yes. Uh, this uh, left uh, top down uh, diagram. So you, you propagate the gravitational wave in a magnetic field, right? And yeah. uh, you generate electromagnetic wave radiation. Mm -hmm. then that electromagnetic radiation leaks out from that first cube or not? But or is confined? It's confined, it's a cavity. You, you try to load the cavity. Okay, so, yeah. so on the other side you have uh, 
another process, the same gravitational wave, right? Yeah. Uh, but now you have not a magnetic field, but you have an electromagnetic wave, a logarithmic cavity. Yeah. But you will, so how, how is the detection of this scheme? So you will have different frequencies, right? Exactly. You, you want to then the readout is about the second mode, for instance. The, the one I, there is one mode loaded. Mm -hmm. And what you want to find is the second mode as well. Yeah. And, and you want to compare with uh, the first process that happens in the where the magnetic field is static, or not? those are different. For instance, yeah, yeah. In principle, I mm -hmm. mean, I guess technologically, it's not the same the way you design one or the other, right? But in principle, the, you can access both. I mean, this this kind of process is more for, as I said, to look for frequencies which are the frequencies of the cavity. In this case, is the difference of two frequencies. So you can, even with a cavity, which is let's say one centimeter, you can go to way, way lower frequencies because the, the important frequency here is the difference of these two modes. Okay. okay. Yeah. But okay. this looks like Alps too, so to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you I... have it, in the first, you have, you have a closed cavity. And in the second, you have a cavity, which has a, which, which is loaded a bit with the, with the green light. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. It's the first time I'm talking about this. So okay, I may yeah, have some. that's it. Sounds, <laughs> sounds good. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. But I also want to say that precisely because of this workshop and these efforts, uh, there are other possibilities that come to mind in terms of, for instance, interference of of modes and how maybe gravity waves may destroy this interference. I have no idea if you can't ever reach, I mean, read out these things. But well. I hope that uh, you know there will be other, at least just in, the, in, the, in these days with our uh, small team, we have already uh, realized that we, there are other possibilities. But for now, let us be concrete and focus on this. So, so for concreteness, yes. yes. Can I just ask a question? So, so just related to the last point, though. Um, so, how do you know, for instance, that you know if you do get some sort of mechanical shaking of the wall, that you really saw a gravitational wave and not generated an axion that you didn't know existed? Oh, like, yeah. You tell the two apart. Yeah, yeah, the, the geometry of the modes is different. So the way you couple, so if you are, when you excite a particular mode, it has some quadrupole or monopolar, the monopolar um, uh, sensitivity. So in principle, you can design your, 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 your readout to read some particular modes. Is that clear? So you don't excite oh, only see, one mode, you, you, you excite see. different modes. And this has, is, the, is different if you are spin two or spin zero. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Right. Indeed, uh, I'll show one, one example. So this is something that uh, has not been shown in the, in the workshop so far, I think, and it's very important. So the choice of frame, okay? Uh, and it's one of the details, one of the details which is classical and has to be done properly. So this lab, this cavity is living in the surface of the earth or, or in the space, wherever you want to put it. But the point is that in principle, the ones that we are going to build are not in free falling. Right? So they are in a accelerated frame. Accelerated with respect to what? With respect to the uh, free falling observer that would be here. Okay. So the laboratory coordinates are, well, then you go to some text book. So I mean, this is a particular reference, which is very nice, where this person has included uh, how do you change from one frame to the other when you have. Um, perturbation in the metric in the local inertial frame. And you want to see how does it look like in the laboratory frame. And then you see that for in, there is a, a contribution having to do with acceleration, right? In particular, I like this one. There was a talk about this, for instance, you see that if, you, if your frame is rotating with respect to the free falling frame, you can uh, resonate your, rota your rotation with the gravity wave frequency and maybe uh, use this for something. The problem is that it's hard to rotate fast, uh, you know, sensitive, uh, sensitive um, and large uh, detectors. But yeah, that's an important thing. But also, you see, even if you at the beginning only had, let's say, H plus uh, um, polarization, it's going to leak down, leak into other uh, parts of the metric. Okay, that's, this is suppressed, okay, but it's there. More importantly, you need to understand the gravity wave in the local inertial frame. 
the local initial frame, when you compute it, the perturbations at first order in omega, sorry, the first uh, contribution in omega lambda, so in the frequency multiplying the size of the detector, are given by the curvature and then the, you know, how much you uh, go away from the center of mass or from the center of, of reference of this free falling trajectory. I hope everyone has kind of seen this before. So this is the H00, Hij, H0i. The curvature is, a, in principle, would be a beast that's quite complicated, but at first order in gravitational waves, we are quite lucky that you can just take the one computed in any other gauge because at first order it's gauge invariant. So you take just the one from the sources of whatever book you, you want to use. So it's really, this is not a problem. So you, for, the, for the curvature here, you can take the TT gauge, no problem. I, I hope this is clear. But, but, you know, even, and I go back to this again, even if at the beginning you had only one polarization, let's say uh, with only uh, diagonal components in the X and Y directions, because of the change of frame, you can see that you are going to develop uh, basically uh, for, um, components of the metric in all other directions. So you cannot just take, in other words, the metric in the TT frame and put it in your detector where equations. That's wrong because your detector sees this metric, right? This proper detector frame. Indeed, it sees this metric, but it's true that. Normally, you know, you are never very relativistic. So in principle, all these corrections are small, but these corrections are order one. Okay, so in principle, the, the corrections to the metric because you are uh, in, a, in, a, in a frame which is free falling as compared to the TT frame are important. Not only that, if you are uh, thinking about what we, are, what we want to do in particular in the, in the empty cavity, right? In the empty cavity, the frequency here, <laughs> is basically the frequency that resonates in the cavity, which means that this guy, L is the, is the cavity itself, right? So this is order one. But the, 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 modes, the normal modes of a cavity, okay, have frequency such that omega L, L being the, the, the cavity size, this is order one. So you cannot even, I mean, this is even wrong. You, you, this is first order, but you, can, you have to go to next order and indeed you have to, all, to go to all orders. Uh, <laughs> You would say that this is going to be a nightmare, but it's not, luckily. Uh, there's a kind of, uh, you can find the expression for all the components, again, in this, it's a kind of classical result. Of, I didn't know about it because I always imagined that that would be enough for all my life. But uh, it turns out that if you want to, to, to really consider the resonant case, okay, you have to be a bit more um, precise and take into account all the, all the, the comp all, all the, all the sum, okay at um, first order in curvature. So curvature is always small, that's fine. So first order in curvature is fine. And luckily, indeed, for a gravity wave, this is, you can resum it. So this is something very nice. It was done, I, I, we have not seen it in, in the literature. It was done by one of us, uh, by Asher. Uh, and it turns out that you can indeed know this metric exactly. So that's great. Does it matter? Yes, it matters very much because that's, I mean, if, if you want to compute sensitivity and, Precisely, which are, which are the modes that are excited? Precisely, they are questioned by Subot. Do you have a gravity wave or something else? Or can you use ADMX to detect gravity waves? You have to put in the, the right metric. Otherwise, you don't know what you are being. I mean, you don't know what your sensitivity is. Is that clear? So, very important point. Second, very important point you have to understand how the readout of a, of a cavity is being made. All right. So when you define uh, in a cavity a Q factor, uh, that's uh, again, uh, my source is, is this very controversial book called Jackson, right? Where uh, basically the, the the Q factor is the store energy divided by the power you lose as function of time and then multiplied by omega. So basically that tells you that omega over sorry Q over omega is a time scale which is telling you how much time do you have to extract power from your cavity before your mode start to be diluted away, right? That's basically the, the Q over omega. So you take omega down here and you see that this is the kind of time scale that is interesting for you to, 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 to load the cavity uh, and then try to extract all this energy uh, uh, in, in, in some time. 
how do you stack power in this case? Well, uh, as far as I know, you, you put a wave that a wave guide in the center, so uh, whatever uh, this wave wave guide is basically something that, for a theorist, allows you to extract energy. Right. So once you have loaded it, little by little, you are within out. But it takes a long time, so it's not the stored energy now or or, or now. It's really the average stored energy that you are little by little uh, being sensitive to. So when you compute uh, anything having to do with Q factors or with this way of extracting energy or reading out the cavity, the stored energy is a time average stored energy. It's not just the, I mean, if you were able, there was this question by Mike Cruz. Of course, if you were able to, to, to be sensitive to the energy at time uh, or the order of omega, yeah, then the, it would be the, the instantaneous energy that would be important, but that's not what happens. In engineering, <laughs> you, you 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 take some time to to, to read out these cavities, as far as I know. So in, in this uh, in, in this formula, you need in the, for the power that you that you extract from the cavity, uh, there is a coupling. So basically, a coupling constant that is telling you how you can extract this power from the cavity. There is a time scale which is telling you again how much time you have to extract the energy, and then there is an average energy, right, which is again average. Uh, in, in the time scales that you require for for this readout, okay. Very good. You're I, I think that, minutes. All right. <laughs> so uh, once you put in uh, the uh, well, you, you 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 want to compute the energy average of the of the cavity, all right. Then the energy on the mode that you are reading out is going to be again. This is uh, from Jackson, right? It's gonna be the square of E, the square of B. So uh, you compute the square of B and the square of E. And what you realize is that because there is a, a background field, then uh, the energy in the B in the B part of this, there will be a constant part, B0, B1, this oscillates. It's order H, but it oscillates. And at B, I mean, signal square part. When you take the average a function of time, if B0 is not time dependent, this just vanishes and the only signal is gonna come from H squared. If you manage to make B0 oscillate, so for instance, how do you do it? By loading the cavity, right? <laughs> then maybe in this case, uh, you, may, you may be sensitive to a resonance here, but otherwise this is a order H squared signal and because of the way you read out the, the, the cavity. In particular, if you look at ADMX sensitivity and you see the power in the action, you have a look at these two guys here. So this is G squared, so coupling square, rho A. Rho A is, again, field square. So they are telling you that they are sensitive to the square of the, of, of the initial action coming in, right? Which is, again, what I'm, what I'm saying, that this way of doing a uh, readout of the cavity is second order in the, in the, in the field. Okay, so now a bit more to the details. How do we uh, compute the, the loading of the cavity? So what we do is we take the electromagnetic field, we decompose it into modes, the modes which are presently normal in the cavity, the, the, modes, the, the modes that live a lot in the cavity. Those are these uh, space dependent guys. And we want to know how little by little they grow with time. So that means that there are some equations, some differential equations uh, of these guys and load it so with the source that is proportional to the current coming in or the or the wave and um, some background some some mode itself yeah i have to rush up a bit but this is more uh, what well, a bit of the yeah is some details which eventually are not so important but yeah you have to to, to live through them so in the, our work what we show is that once you put um, a gravity wave of a certain frequency and compute the average energy and uh, take into account some noise, uh, first noise estimates that uh, Tito will discuss more in his talk, then uh, you can see that with these quality factors of, 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 uh, of current or, well, I don't know, it's a bit futuristic uh, with the um, cavities, you may be sensitive in the gigahertz band, where is gigahertz here, to uh, this kind of um, strain is not, the, I mean, here we have been a bit futuristic in all, in all, the, in all the, uh, the numbers, but you know, that, that's what it is. Now, uh, there is one number here that you have to compute it uh, precisely the um, way you excite 
the particular mode when the gravity wave can see. All right, this is here. It's another one effect, but it may be zero, right? Because in the end, what are we doing? So there is a wave coming in. There is a magnetic field with a certain direction with respect to the. Let's take this example, which is the simplest. The wave comes in through the cylindrical uh, cavity. The magnetic field, imagine, is, is aligned in a certain direction, alpha. And then you have to compute the, the source to uh, different modes in the cavity according to the orientation of these two guys. And this is something that, again, requires doing it in the frame of reference of the laboratory. And contrary to what happens for the TT gauge, if you do it in the real gauge that you have to do it with the real fields that you see in the lab, there is a, a response even when alpha is equal to zero. So even if you are going through uh, the direction of the magnetic field, and this is uh, something that, again, we, 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 have, we have shown. Uh, so in these diagrams, what are they? So you, you take the angle, so the angle uh, in, this, in this plot, and if there is something uh, particular in this angle, this is giving you the response of the cavity to this um, gravity wave propagating in a certain direction. So for alpha equal to zero, there are no TM modes, that's okay. Uh, TM or TE are uh, depend on the boundary conditions basically, but certainly there is a response of the, I mean, you are loading some modes in the cavity even at angle equal to zero, okay, these TE modes. Now ADMX doesn't use these modes, because the, 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 or the way it is designed, because for the accidents is the opposite that you, you, you load TM modes, but I don't, we don't see any reason why you cannot just look for TM modes. Again, why this is happening is because you are not using this metric in your formula. You have to use this metric, okay? You have to use the metric in your frame. In the frame where, where you have been solving the modes, of course, you could do everything in TT frame, but then you have to transform your electromagnetic modes to this frame, which is an S. So I think it's better to, to, to keep doing it as it is. Yeah, this is basically the same. You can also do the, the, the example where the wave comes from a different direction, not, uh, not longitudinal to the, to the cavity, but from say, at some angles. And we see the same that you, even at alpha equal to zero, you load these T, this TE uh, modes. And yeah, you just need to know how to read them out. Uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, mechanical coupling proceeds in a similar way. In this case, the way you load the the way you load the, the modes is because if you before had a mode in the cavity and suddenly you move the boundaries, then this is no longer an eigen mode of the of the cavity, and you can compute how by vibrating or how by changing the boundary conditions, you also generate a source. Okay, and this is by the way. Uh, it was our inspiration um, from some old uh, proposal from CERN that uh, Tito will describe. And again, you can compute the power uh, and uh, that uh, is, is, is being loaded in this in this in this mode. Yeah, don't look too much about the final result because Tito in the next talk will show you the, the plot. So to conclude, uh, superconducting radio frequency cavities are great. Uh, uh, ways to look for gravity waves at gigahertz. There are these two possibilities, ADMX-like or heterodyne. Uh, it's very important though to get the details right. So you have to do things in the, uh, in the laboratory frame. And also you have to take into account that, uh, yeah, the, you are doing things where the frequency is of the order of, sorry, where the, where the wavelength is of the order of the cavity size, uh, this is not enough. You have to go to all orders. Um, also, the readout, as long as I know, as, as far as I know, uh, is in this kind of cavities has been done for the average energy because you, you, you are not sensitive to the energy at one particular time, but really, uh, as a, as a, you know, it's, it's a time-dependent process. And uh, quite importantly, well, the, when you put all this together, yeah, ADMX is, of course, uh, can be used as it is for to put some constraints, but it's true that you have to be careful and use, I mean, try to look for uh, TE modes and not TM modes. And I want to stop here uh, because then uh, now you're going to see in the next talk how to connect this to the real world where you put noise in. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. Just uh, the time for a few questions. Uh, 
in order. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So thank you very much for this uh, fantastic talk. Uh, so thank it's you. it's it's an in incredibly nice if uh, uh, ADMX, for instance, is also sensitive to the, the uh, in the case of a longitudinal uh, magnetic field. So that's that's really great. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, impressed by all these effects that you that uh, you are considering. I, I just have one question on the frequency. Mm -hmm. You are mentioning mm -hmm. uh, 10 gigahertz as something like a benchmark, but why mm -hmm. is it like that? And why is, is isn't it uh, like uh, 100 megahertz like uh, you have in ADMX? Uh... Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was just as I said that <laughs> here. You mean right? Yeah, exactly. In the strange science. Yeah, yeah. It was to be a bit more. As I said, this uh, when uh, when we put this, I, I took it from some graph that we have, and we have put it at high frequencies to to kind of boost the signal a little bit. But uh, you will see it in the in the next talk. Uh, how does it go for real for more real cavities? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so it could be 100 megahertz because if you take 100 megahertz for WG, then you get uh, you get uh, 10 to minus uh, 25. No. Sorry, if I, if I can add something here. So yeah, um, yeah. The, the volume of the cavity was replaced by the wavelengths in this formula, and if you are at megahertz, then probably your cavity is quite large. So this wouldn't probably work. Ah, so you are considering a rather small cavity. Okay. Yes. Okay. This W is related to the size. Okay. I, I, that is why I, I, I get it. Yeah. The gigahertz so, is three centimeters. Yeah. Yeah. So for ID, DMX, I, I'm not wrong. It, it would be smaller. The signal, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For, um, Fernando. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Yes, uh, okay, uh, thank you, Diego. Nice talk. Uh, I was wondering <clears throat> in this analysis of, of the inertial uh, local frame. Uh, mm -hmm. I was surprised it was not done before. Is, is, is that, done. Could that be relevant for, for LIGO, for instance? No, because in this, well, in this case, the, precisely in this case, you are not, you are in this region. But still, in this case, uh, the, the wavelength is, is much larger than the, than the size. Right, I but think. the previous analysis with, with, with the approximation. That, that was that was already done. I, I, I see. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Camilo. Uh, yes, uh, I, I also want to ask something about this uh, uh, metric. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. how do you define this X? So I'm, I'm a bit, uh, well, I want to X? understand the details. Yes. So what is X? X, <laughs> yes. X is the distance uh, with respect to the center of mass that is following the geodesic uh, at this particular time. So you, you take you can in principle you can choose any any point in, in the in the in the cavity. I don't know. I don't have any anything. But you you basically take the cavity, center of mass of the cavity, and center of mass is the local inertial frame. And then from the local inertial frame, which uh, as you know, for which the metric is um, Minkowski, and it sees all the modes as you know <laughs> would be like you would have the standard electromagnetism there, right? So uh, X is a uh, you know, the coordinates with respect to this uh, center of mass. Okay. And <clears throat> sorry, if I might ask an additional question. Sure, so sure. does it mean that uh, this new age that you are considering uh, mm -hmm. is not transverse to the gravitational wave anymore? Right. Okay. That's, that's correct. Okay, just a last question. The, the, the DT gauge, gauge is, is, is great because it, the gravity waves are simple, but when they come to you, you are not in a TT gauge <laughs> normally. It's, uh, yeah, that's life. Okay. Okay. Michael, um, just a last question, please. Yeah, I was. I'm a, I'm a little confused. Which is your um, background mode and your readout mode? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, it's gonna be more in the next talk because I I and, I, I, I which, run a bit fast in this. In, in this particular oh, okay. sensitivity here is the you don't we don't know the mode. It's ADMX one ADMX like. Uh, for the other one, for the right. for well, this one, for the mechanical sensitivity, that may be more of interest to you. If, uh, I, yeah, say ADMX, to... if I say ADMX like, that means you've got to have your azimuthal number zero and your um, right. your last longitudinal number zero. Um, yeah. uh, but this seems opposite. You, you, you can't have anything zero. None of your mode right. numbers can be zero because that's 
that's what I understand of your difference between solenoidal and irritational electric field. Only right. solenoidal, only solenoidal ones are loaded in this in, in the way we define them. <laughs> so are sorry sensitive to gravity waves. So I don't know. If maybe so that's why that's why you got the TM one two one and two one two. If you put zero exactly. there, then it wouldn't work. That, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So it's it's opposite to ADMX. <laughs> okay. It's opposite. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And this has to do with the spin of the, as was mentioned before. Yeah, so I understand why it has to do with that. Yeah. I worked it out as you were talking. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Okay. Any questions? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Diego. And